So we're going to take a look here at the nervous system and what we're talking about when we talk about the nervous system is the ability to take sensory input, create a cognitive perception, and also have an immediate homeostatic regulation to that sensory input stimulus. The way in which this pathway works is it's an ascending pathway where we start with the stimulus that leads to reception. This is all peripheral. We then start getting what's referred to as integration and perception. This is the initiation of central function. That perception will then get integrated into cognition. If we are at the peripheral side of everything, we get reflexive responses. These are typically monosynaptic and disynaptic. They are at level responses within the system. There is no necessity to have perception on this level of processing. As we move up into central regulation, we start getting multiple reflexive responses. This also leads to reactive responses where we're able to go about pre-cognitively setting what the reflexive response will be. This is a multiple synaptic level response, which means that we're pulling in a variety of synaptic networks into the overall response that we see. Eventually, what ends up happening is we get to a delineation between where do we see a peripherally controlled system and where do we see a centrally controlled system. In that centrally con controlled system, we get a phenomenon known as cognitive response and memory. This cognitive response and memory is an emotional response to what we are integrating into the cognition. If we don't get to this cognitive response, even if I am momentarily cognizant of the stimulus, I won't remember it. And this lays down the neural network patterning for subsequent responses to happen without needing cognitive integration. If that stimulus pathway has been laid down, but I don't have a memory of it. I won't remember that it happened previously, and I'll get a what is usually referred to as a deja vu moment the next time I recognize that stimulus. This pathway to cognitive response and memory is hindered by the fact that we are being bombarded with hundreds of millions of stimuluses every second of every day, and we can only be cognizantly aware of so many of those various stimuli. The way in which we're able to function within the system is through the functions of the neurons. Neurons are the functional unit of the system. They're the functional cell of the system. The key characteristics that we look at when we look at the neurons is that they fall under the excitable tissue category, which means that they're able to generate an action potential that leads to structural and functional changes within the, within the tissue. They are aerobic obligated tissue. They have to have constant perfusion in order to continue to do metabolic activity. They can only sustain between three and five minutes without having a source of oxygen in order to continue their metabolic activity to regenerate ATP. Most of the ATP that is being used by the neuron is with reestablishing the membrane potentials within the neuron. The nervous system makes up a very small proportion of total body mass. However, it accounts for over 20% of total energetic expenditure. The cells themselves are amitotic once they are mature. We do get new neurons throughout our lives. However, the rate at which the new neurons come about is much slower than the rate at which we lose neurons due to apoptotic signaling. That leads to the misconception that we are going to be constantly losing neurons throughout our lives. We do lose neurons. However, the total quantity of neurons, we are still getting replacement neurons. And the way in which the neurons replace themselves is based off of what's referred to as radial growth. And that radial growth will get influenced by a whole host of factors that trigger stress responses and inflammatory responses that limit the total growth that can take place within the neuron itself. 
in terms of histological recognition, we have a couple of structures that we should be aware of. We have a prominent nucleus and nucleolus within the cell body. We have a cluster of microbodies, which we refer to as nissel bodies, sometimes referred to as the chromatophilic substances. We have what we refer to as the neurocytoskeletal structures. The neurocytoskeletal structures are neurofilaments and neurotubules that make up the bulk of the cell itself. Now we have to remember that the cell itself is coming from columnar secretory cells that become specialized in terms of their cell structure as well as their overall cell function. These microfilaments and microtubules or neurotubules are what are going to allow for the projections of the axons and the dendrites within the neuron itself. It's also going to be involved with the movement of materials through the fast and slow axonal transmission rates. We also have clumps of materials within the neuron itself, sometimes referred to as the lipofusin pigmented clumps. These lipofusinal pigmented clumps can become problematic with damage to the axon and damage to the dendrite. So let's take a look at the neurons that we will prominently see within the system. And so this is the prototypical neuron when we think about neurons. Now, once again, remember neurons are coming from columnar secretory epithelial cells. The secreting ends of the neurons are at the synoptic knob or synoptic end or axon terminal or synaptic bouton. The key areas of the neuron as it relates to overall function is the axon hillock, which is the region that we must reach threshold in order to have action potential. The dendrites, which is the area that is undergoing depolarization and hyperpolarization moments based off of the neurotransmitters that the neuron is interacting with. The axon, which is going to be transmitting that action potential away from the soma or cell body. There are within myelinated neurons specialized regions that are important towards this passage of the action potential, and those are the nodes of Rambier, which is the area of the axon not interacting with the Schwann cell forming the myelin sheath. Now axons and dendrites are interesting because they can sprout what are referred to as collaterals or branches in them based off of the relative level of use that the neuron will undergo. The more action that the neuron is seeing, the more branches we will see in both dendrites as well as within the axons. This branching of the axons also allows for collateral inputs. This collateral inputting of axons on terminal sites allows for the different neuronal networking to take place. It also allows for secondary neuronal controls of areas through what's referred to as axonal sprouting. Sprouting will occur when we have excessive use of the axons, meaning the neuron is being constantly being used. Opposite of sprouting is what's referred to as pruning, and that's where we will lose both dendrites as well as the terminals of the axons, not from being overused, but from being underused. So that's the prototypical neuron, but there are different types of neurons based off of how the arrangements of these prototypical structures lay out. And so we have five distinct types of neurons. We have unipolar, bipolar, multipolar. In multipolar, we have two subcategories. We have what's referred to as the pyramidal and the Purkinje. And then we have the anoxonal or anaxonic neurons. There's a specialized type of the anoxonic or axonic 
neuron, which is sometimes referred to as the rose bud inhibitory neuron, and we'll show that in here in a second. So let's take a look at the five types of neurons based off of their ability to pass specialized signals. So unipolar, unipolar will have one mode of transmission to the soma and one mode of transmission away from the soma. We usually see these unipolars within the sensory neurons. The bipolar, the bipolar will have one mode of transmission into the soma, but two modes of transmission out of the soma. So we'll have two axon projections on the bipolar, whereas we only have one axon projection on the unipolar. We usually see bipolar neurons in the interneuronal classification of neurons. These are the neurons that are, are connecting the unipolars with other bipolars or with the next class, the multipolars. The multipolars typically have multiple means of accessing the soma and can have one or more axonal projections away from the soma. We usually see these multipolars on the efferent side of the system, controlling glandular and muscle function. A specialized form of this multipolar is the Purkinje pyramidal cells, which are responsible for motor coordination and motor control. The last form is what's referred to as the anoxonic. The anoxonic, we cannot differentiate which is the axon and which is the dendrite. And so we can't map out clear, distinct arrows of transmissions on the anoxonic. The last type, which is a specialized case of the anoxonic, is what's referred to as the rose hip inhibitory neuron. This is one of the newer neurons that have just been found. It is found within the cortex along with the anoxonic. As indicated, it is an inhibitory neuron and is predominantly involved with motor regulation and formation of memory within the pathways being laid out within the system.